Hey, good morning everybody. So today in the driveway we have a 1995 Lexus SC300. It's got about 230,000 miles on the clock. Uh, a couple neighbors picked up this vehicle from another neighbor for I think 400 or 450 bucks in non-running condition. So we pushed it from my neighbor's house into my driveway uh, and lo and behold it ran. So go figure, non-running and now it runs. So first thing I did is uh, we let it run uh, at idle sounded pretty bad actually it sounds like it has a misfire so the first thing i did given the mileage is i went to make sure that the timing marks are still uh, aligned because this is a timing belt vehicle and again 230,000 miles who knows the history so to check the timing there's a notch right here on the intake cam a notch right here in the exhaust cam it should line up with these notches in the cover right here and down below let's see if we can get you down there way down in there there will be a notch on the crank that you uh, on the crank pulley that you want to line up with a zero um, that's kind of in the crankcase it's really hard to see let me see if I can get just some more light yeah I don't think it's going to work but it's way down in there you'll see it um, if it doesn't line up turn the crank another revolution and if it lines up you're good to go if things don't line up uh, then your belt may have skipped a tooth this belt actually looks to be in reasonably good condition. The teeth don't feel loose or anything. So I'm guessing our problem is elsewhere. So I think next, um, I'm just gonna pull the distributor cap and just see what that looks like. This could be a pretty simple ignition system problem. I did already remove the coil plug wire just because you know I wanted to be safe while I was turning the, the crank over by hand. I think it was a 23 millimeter socket. You could turn it with a, right down there, a socket. So let's get that distributor cap off and take a look inside. All right, so before all you armchair warriors start criticizing me, just be aware, I've never worked on this vehicle. I never worked on this type of vehicle. So I'm sure you all probably already know what's wrong with this thing. I'm using an eight here, by the way, but I don't. So we're just gonna figure it out. To make an engine run, run well, you need fuel, you need air, you need spark and compression. Well, I guess kind of air and compression kind of go hand in hand. So we obviously have enough to make it run, but run poorly. And that's what we're trying to figure out right now. So it looks like this cap has three eight millimeter screws down here, up here, and where I'm turning right now. I'm just gonna pull the cap off as an assembly. And in case it is not indexed, I'm just gonna put a little mark on it just to make sure I put it back in the same orientation. All the distributor caps I pulled in my career have are indexed, so you can only put them on one way, but with my luck, this will be the first that isn't, so. I've just put a little pen mark up here. So I know how it came off. If we're lucky, this will be just a simple ignition problem. Let's see, do I, I, oh wow, these plug wires from 2001. That's probably not a good sign. So that might be part of our problem. Might be getting crosstalk between the wires or high resistance wires. This might just be a simple ignition problem. Probably should have let you guys hear this thing first before I got into it. I'm gonna try a Phillips head screwdriver for this bottom one. Might be a little bit easier. Actually, did I, yeah, I can start working on this one. Yeah, Phillips head screwdriver is a bit easier on this one. What we can also do with this vehicle is we can pull codes out of the computer. Now this is pre-OBD2, so we can't use an OBD2 scanner. The OBD2, OBD1 systems generally use proprietary scanners, which I do not have. But there is a little trick that you can do. But let's start here before we get there. That rotor doesn't look so hot. I'll show you. Normally they just yank straight off. And this one, does this have a fastener? No, no fastener. But it doesn't want to come off just the same. But if you look on this part right here, zoom you guys in. It's 
it's kind of all boogered up right here. Yeah, it's not in great shape. Interestingly, the cap looks fine. I don't see any serious problems with the cap. I don't see any nasty marks on any of these terminals here. So I'm guessing someone probably replaced the cap without the rotor, which is kind of stupid. So we'll see if we can get a, ro a rotor for this thing. I don't know if that's going to fix our problem, but it might. Just curious how that thing comes off. I don't see a screw anywhere. Oh, wait, no, I do see... Though, yeah, those might be fasteners. In these little recesses here, it feels like there might be fasteners in there. Feels like two Phillips screws in here. Let's take this off and look at it on the bench. Good thing I didn't pull too hard, right? And break the thing. There's one. So just for reference, that's kind of what a new part looks like, and that's what ours looks like. So you can see that that leading edge there and the leading edge here, how messed up it is. So you can zoom in there. Yeah, I think you get the idea. So that's uh, $4.26. We'll add that to the list. Just clean it up a little bit with a wire brush. Again, I'm not going to, I'm going to replace this part, but I just want to see if this has any effect on how well it, it runs. Also cleaned up that center button with a little bit of um, emery cloth. So it's better than it was, but still needs to be replaced. All right, got the rotor reinstalled. Uh, I'm going to put the cap back on. We'll see if that has any effect on how it runs. Not expecting a tremendous difference, but take anything I can get. No music, sir. Okay, got the rotor reinstalled. Let's put our ignition wire back on. We'll fire it up and see if that made any difference. I'm not expecting miracles here. But maybe we'll get lucky. It'll be a $4 part. Make sure we're clear of tools and everything. Yeah, we're good. That noise you hear is uh, the power steering pump over here. It doesn't sound so hot. Let me rev it up a little bit. Doesn't seem too significantly different, which is not surprising. One thing I did notice is we have no tack signal, which is kind of interesting because for this for the tack to work, this pro it's probably picked up on either the cam trigger here or the crank trigger, which is somewhere not here. I don't see it right now, but it's probably somewhere nearby, maybe on the crank pulley down there on the trans bell housing. Um, I think what we'll do next is we'll go into the computer and check for codes. All right, I know I said I know nothing about this vehicle, but I cheated a little bit. Uh, I found a copy of the factory service manual for, I think, 97 onwards, 1997 onwards, but it should be fairly similar. And actually, maybe, it's, maybe it covers this year, too, because I see a diagnostic procedure for um, the OBD-1 system. This is like pre... Pre-1996 onward, where you have that universal plug, this is all like manufacturer-specific stuff. So you can see here the procedure for um, reading out the trouble codes. You have to short out uh, on the, the connector under the hood or the one under the, 
the steering column, to short out T1 and E1 with a jumper wire. And then in theory, that should cause the codes to flash out on the um, malfunction indicator lamp, also known as the check engine light. So it flashes out like, you know, flash one, flash two for, for two, flash one, two, three for three, and so on. So you can get a readout of what the codes are that way. Older Chrysler products of the similar vintage kind of work the same way, except you just use, use key on, key on cycles. And that triggers the, the same kind of code readout. So let's give that a shot. All right, so here is our diagnostic plug. We'll open that. And we just got to short out T1 and E1. Let me just go grab a jumper wire I can use. All right, I made a little jumper wire out of some 14-gauge uh, um, housing wire, also known as Romex. So again, we're going after terminal E1, which is right here, and terminal TE1, which is that center one right there. So we'll just stick our jumper wire in there and pray it doesn't let the smoke out. And I think a number 14 wire might be too big. But maybe not. Although I may have had to put the ignition switch on first. Yeah, probably. So this is turn the ignition switch on, but do not start the engine. Push the overdrive main switch to on. But I think this is also in the transmission section, so that part probably doesn't matter all that much. Let's do key on. All right, we are key on. And we'll short out those two terminals again. And then we'll go and look at the check engine light. So it's just flashing non-stop. I'll show you what it looks like. Not sure how well you can see this, but overdrive light there is flashing like crazy. Check engine light is flashing flash, 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 about maybe once every half a second or so. So I'm gonna go look up and see what that means in the manual. All right, I'm not really sure what's going on here. So I'm gonna disconnect the jumper wire because I, I see the overdrive light and the check engine light flashing constantly but it's not flashing in any pattern other than on, off, you know, on, off, on, 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 off. It's like just a repeatable pattern. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it into hand, in hand, what I think the manual calls enhanced diagnostic mode, where you short uh, E1 and TE2 on this connector buried way under there. I can't get the camera in there, but I'll show you. But first you have to do ignition off. Let me get the jumper wire and hook it up. The terminals are labeled on the, on the cover. I switched over to a piece of welding wire as a jumper wire. The 14 gauge building wire was a bit too much. And I'm going blind, I can't see anything. TE2, so it's... So if you're looking at the connector, all the way on the bottom right, the bottom right pin is TE1, the one to the left of that is TE2, the one to the left of that, so three in from the right on the bottom right, that's E1. So I'm going to short the second pin in to the third pin in on the bottom right. It's really tough to see though. Probably need 20 year old eyes to do this. Really tough to see. Sorry about that. All right, I think I got it. Let's start her up, see if it does anything interesting or lets the magic smoke out. Just gonna rev it a little bit. I don't know if you can see, but I still have no tack signal.
we'll let that run for a minute. All right, I think that's enough. Let's shut it down. Engine's hunting all over the place. Okay, grab my jumper wire. I'm gonna short this back to T1 and E1, TE1, under the hood. Okay, got TE1 and E1 shorted under the hood. Let's see what happens. Oh wait, I think I'm supposed to do that with the key already on, right? Yeah, I think I am. See, kind of the same behavior, just the flashing overdrive and check engine light. Just flash, 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 nonstop. Yeah, so that's kind of the, what we're seeing. Flash, 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 so that says no code is recorded. So, like I said, some of these early diagnostic systems can be kind of useless. So I still think there's something going on because we don't have a tack signal. Granted, the tack could be just broken, um, but that is also pulled from either the crank camera or the crank trigger. So I'm gonna look through this manual a little bit and see if I could find out what might cause the tack to not work. I was able to get the power steering pump to quiet down considerably by simply changing the fluid. Uh, I don't know who put what in there, but it, the pump says it should take automatic transmission fluid, and whatever in there was in there was not automatic transmission fluid. It was very clear and kind of, um, low viscosity, so I sucked it out with uh, this bad boy, leave a link in the description, and uh, I dumped in some uh, Dexron 3, so I'm just going to do that again, turn the steering wheel back and forth a couple of times just to circulate the fluid around, just dilute whatever was in there, it's considerably quieter, so let's go and suck that out again. So, simply insert this bad boy into the reservoir here. It's actually a lot darker than what was in there before, but still not dark enough for pure transmission fluid. So I'm just rejecting this stuff into a waste oil container that I have here. We'll do the same thing again. Unless maybe I got it all. There we go. And we'll just use that to dilute whatever um, not transmission fluid was in here. Pretty easy. Pouring the fresh stuff in. This is not fancy. This is just what I had on the shelf. And the dipstick has hot and cold marks. Just make sure you respect those. So we're a little bit below cold, so we'll add some more. Beautiful. So each time you do that, it should get a little bit quieter. Did a couple more fluid exchanges. The pump is a lot quieter now. I think I was able to duplicate the original complaint. So I just let the vehicle run for a while, then went inside, came back, and it was dead. And now it's doing this. Let's see if it's uh, still going to do it now. Starts, runs for a minute, and then dies. Just like that, I didn't shut it off. I can try to rev it and hold it, but no, no go. Hitting the gas, it's almost like it's at a, it's almost like it's dying from no gas. Nobody's home. So, I'm guessing this is some kind of fueling issue. Um, don't know that for sure. Again, I've never worked on this vehicle, but that, that's a typical symptom of a bad fuel pump. Um, not just gonna go swapping parts and hoping for the best, we're gonna diagnose it. Um, 
I'm gonna look in that service manual, see if I can find some diagrams of the pump and see what's involved. And just for giggles, I tried unplugging the mass airflow sensor, which is right here, and saw no difference whatsoever. So it did the exact same thing. Starts, then dies, starts, then dies. Of course, all the connectors and every single wiring, every single, all the tabs and every connector are pretty much broken off on this vehicle because of age. Um, so yeah, let me get back to it. Let me go look at the diagram, diagrams, see if I can figure out what might be going on. All right, so the service manual actually talks about shorting out two pins on here to activate the fuel pump. I believe it's they're on the left side, the top left and bottom left, but let me just double check. All right, so stupid me. I was double checking the pinouts, but they're actually listed inside the cap, so I'm, I'm shorting out FP to B positive, to B plus, which is battery positive, so let's see what happens. And I think if this allows it to run, that tells us something. So I did real, I did look online and there is a fuel pump control module on this thing and there's a, that thing seems to have a reputation for going bad. So I, I think this will bypass it. I'm not 100% sure, but let's see what effect it has. Oh boy, it doesn't let the smoke out. Running a lot better. I think that might be our problem. Let's try yanking that wire out and see what happens, right? Uh, that wire might be getting hot. Looks like it may have melted into the cap a little bit. And it dies. I don't know if you can see that, but there's some plastic on the top. Yeah, it looks like it was melting into the plastic. So yeah, that's our problem though. You saw it, I yanked this wire out and it died. All right, everybody. So at a very high level, what we need to do, we need to remove the back seat. It's going to be kind of difficult to do uh, to film it just because there's not a lot of room here, but move the seats all the way forward like so. The back bottom just lifts right out like that. Let's remove it. Take it this way. I got one of my neighborhood slaves here. Sorry, I should have said that. Neighborhood friends. Right, Rob? Um, now we got to remove three bolts that hold the back in. Oh, where's the third? Okay, there it is. I think they're 12 millimeters. So let me get a 12 millimeter. And please don't be offended by my use of the word slave. It was just a joke, okay? The guy that's helping me is a dear friend of mine. So this is one, right? They're not terribly tight. Not that's good or bad. One. You want to get those two? Yeah. And now our fuel pump control module is inside this panel, I believe. And there is a procedure online that we're going to try and follow. Well, first I'm going to see if this, this fuel pump control module is fixable. I don't know if I explained before, but it's actually a, a dual speed pump. So at idle or when there's not a lot of fuel demand from the motor, it'll run the pump at nine volts and then it'll up it to 12 whenever you're on you know, full throttle or whatnot or accelerating. And I believe that module has gone bad. Could be a capacitor inside, could be anything really, but uh, we'll take a look at it. We'll see if we can fix it. If not, we'll just bypass it. And like I said, there's a procedure online for doing that. You're just going to run the pump at high speed all the time, which could be good or bad. Um, may ultimately shorten the life of the pump, may not. Um, so yeah, we'll see. Man, this vehicle is so old, everything's coming apart. It's amazing, amazing you can take this thing apart with a ratchet. This I know, right? So I guess we got to pull the back seat I guess it up, right? Up oh, and it rotates. Got to get the seat belt off here, yeah. 
Sorry, you're getting a look at my backside here, guys. Okay. I right, watch the seatbelt there, at the top. This back seat's coming up. This back seat's coming apart anyway. You want to take that towards you? Yep. It's not heavy. Okay. Lightening the car, guys. It's faster now. All right, so let me see if I can position you inside the vehicle so you can see what I'm doing. All right, so I got you guys set up in the car. This is that push pin that needs to come out. Oh, it didn't break. Or did it? Nope, it didn't. Amazing. So now this panel should just pop off. Carefully. Very carefully. Someone's been in here before. There we go. And this should be our module here. Fuel pump control right there. So now we gotta unhook that like so. And where's the ratchet? That's not a 12, that looks more like a 10. Yeah, we get a 10, be right back. Live. All right, Let's take our 10 millimeter. Unbolt this bad boy. We'll take it to the bench and take a look at it. I believe the modification involves modifying this harness, but if we can avoid that. Let's do it. Just let's take a peek at the wires. Yeah, it's pretty obvious what has to happen. Just look in here. So just think about this logically, right? So you have a couple of really skinny wires, three skinny wires and two much bigger wires. Guarantee you those big fat wires are the ones that drive the fuel pump. Only because the fuel pump consumes a lot of current. Let's get you guys over to the bench. Got the module on the bench here. Let's see what we can do. So we got a couple screws here that go into the heat sink. They're pretty tight. So use a good screwdriver for this. Make sure all the screws fly over the bench. That's kind of a requirement. I think I'm being, I think I'm kidding myself if this is going to come apart easily, but you never know. sound. Yeah. Those things on the side just push in? No, nothing really pushes. There, it's going. And so the cover's breaking too. So we're fixing and breaking at the same time. It's always exciting, right? Gotta get the steel bracket off. I'm in the process though, I'm cracking the cover. Cover is really flimsy. It's a pretty tight fit. All right, there we go. So now looks like it might be glued together. I don't see any other fasteners. I'm guessing this heat sink is for the driver inside. Can we pry this apart? Well, I stab myself with the screwdriver. I have a feeling this thing is sealed for life. It looks like it's glued shut. I see some gray stuff oozing out the sides here. Challenge accepted. Or maybe I'm destroying it, who knows? We'll find out in a minute, right? I'm guessing the printed circuit board is going to be on the bottom half of this just because that's where the heat sink is.
There we go. So this is the inside of the fuel pump control module. As expected, I see some pretty large capacitors in here. No obvious signs of leakage. And if there is a printed circuit board in here, it's buried. I think I'm going to call this thing non-fixable, or at least not worth fixing. I mean, if I saw like this capacitor that obviously exploded, yeah, that might be worth going after, but that's not what I'm seeing. Actually, is there a printed circuit board in here? Yeah, there is, all the way at the bottom. You gotta remember, this part's really old, too. So it looks like, let's see if we can kind of visualize where these wires go. So there's a total of five pins coming in. Looks like there's a resistor of some kind. Are they using a resistor to drop the voltage? Power resistor? I hope not. Pretty poor design. All right. Again, I don't think this thing is worth fixing, so I think we'll just get right to um, doing our bypass. If anybody does know how to fix this thing or what's wrong, all ears. All right, so I found a wiring diagram inside the service manual. Here you can see the fuel pump ECU. Up here, up here you have the main engine ECU here. So you have this wire here, looks like pink, and this one that's like red and green, going to the fuel pump ECU. You have this E wire that seems to complete the circuit for the fuel pump. That might be a ground point or something. In here you have FP, which is green, and B plus, which is battery. So you can see that the wire going from, let's see, the fuel pump, this G wire, and B plus, I bet you if we connect those two together, um, we'll have a working fuel pump. And I did cheat a little bit. Yeah, that is a ground point. You see a ground right here. So it looks like the ground is shared between the fuel pump, the fuel pump ECU. We connect B plus and this FP wire, which is green and red and black respectively. Um, that should drive our fuel pump at high speed all the time. So let's give that a shot. So I'm just gonna take a razor knife and peel back some of this tape here or insulation, loom, whatever you wanna call it, just to give us access to the wires. And so like the diagram showed, here are our other wires right here. And these two, be willing to bet you money, these go directly to the fuel pump. So we just got to send battery positive to that fuel pump. Strip that back a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cut them off. Not right at the connector, I'm going to cut them right about here. So if we ever have to reconnect them again, we have enough room to do so. Make sense? So uh, before I'm doing this, please note that I, I disconnected and isolated the negative battery terminal. I did that off camera, but I did do that. Let's cut these right about here. No turning back now, folks. Let me get my wire strippers. We'll wire nut those together just to make sure this fixes the problem. And then we'll do a more permanent repair. Here we go. So we're just gonna strip these wires back a little bit. It looks like maybe 16 gauge or 14. It's hard to tell. Yeah, probably 14. Kind of makes sense. Fuel pumps draw a lot of current. Or maybe it's not 14, maybe it is 16. That's tough wire, whatever it is. There we go. So let's wire nut these together temporarily fire up the car and make sure it works. All right, there we go. So I'm gonna hook up the negative battery terminal and we're gonna start the car. All right, got the battery hooked back up. Let's fire it up. Hope it doesn't let out the magic smoke. Let it run for a little while. 
let it warm up. All right, guys, so this thing has been running for probably a good 15, 20 minutes. Absolutely no issue. Seems to actually run pretty good. It's quiet, has a good idle. It's a little fast, but that might be like an idle air control motor or something. Um, so next step is to just make that wire nutted repair something a little bit more permanent. Okay, we're back. So to do this repair, I'm gonna use some solder, some flux, and some heat shrink tubing. And of course, a soldering iron. So the first step is to put heat shrink tubing on the wire. Don't forget to do that. Gotta get comfortable here, it's really tight here. Ugh. We'll connect these two wires together, like so. I'll dip them in this flux. Now I got water in the flux. I wonder how that happened. And we'll use our soldering iron to permanently attach the wires. I haven't used this soldering iron in a very long time. Hopefully it still, oh yeah, it still works. Look at that. How nice. Generously add solder. That's good. Those wires are never coming apart. Wait for that to cool for a moment. Then we'll take a heat gun and we'll heat shrink that wrap over that, that wire. Just trim it down a little bit. Now you always want to do the, uh, do some kind of permanent type of repair like with solder because vehicles vibrate, things move around and you don't want these wires coming apart and vehicles dying on the highway or something, right? Just good practice. Let's bend this over. Oh boy, maybe we can't. I think we got too much solder on there. I'll try and bend it. Yeah, I don't think that's going to work. I goofed. So what we'll do is just put this wire nut on there. Or a wire nut just to protect it. And we'll just wrap it with some tape. Not one of my finer moments, but this will work. It's permanent. It's not going to vibrate apart. Sorry folks, got a little aggressive with the solder there. But it's safe, it'll work, it's not coming apart. We'll get some electrical tape and make that a little bit more permanent. And then we'll just wrap this up with our tape. There we go. Might as well wrap these two together to keep things from banging around. And we might as well just wrap it over here. Put it back in this loom. Keep everything together. And we'll just wrap it all together to keep it from banging around when the car is being driven.
there we go. That should do it, folks. Time for reassembly. First step is to put this panel back on. That oh, looks like there was another push pin right here. You can see it behind the seatbelt. back here and we got one that goes behind oh went behind the seat belt can we even get to that anymore how'd that go in does this trim piece come off oh i see so this this seat belt cover has to come off getting a screwdriver getting windy out here get this done before the rain comes. It looks like it's going to pour any second. I think we'll be okay though. Don't have much left to do. So I'm just undoing this screw here. Pulls that faster out. And then this thing should move side should maybe not though might be just good enough to slide this piece in I don't think so frustrating Freaking pieces of plastic. There we go. So let's get this out of the way. Get that shoved up in there. Get this push pin and insert it there. And then we gotta shove this back in. Obviously did not do this, taking things apart because I didn't know that fastener was there. And you can see here on the back of this seatbelt clip, it's a metal clip, and there's that little screw. Does not want to go back in. Shocking, I know, right? Kind of have to wedge it down over the, the lip of this trim piece. And then this screw thing should go back in behind the seat belt. Like so. Okay, now our seat back can go back in. Now this piece is in. Should go under here though, like so. Where's our seat back? Man, this seat's in pretty horrible shape. You just touch it and it caves in. The sun's just baked it to death. I just touched this right here and I did that. Let's try not to touch it. It's a shame, but you know, it's what happens. Eventually the Sun and the earth will reclaim everything. No amount of leather conditioner will solve this problem. Make sure you get your seat belts 
over and around. Get our bolts back in. Remember there's three of them. middle one's being a little uncooperative. Probably best to put them all in loose and then tighten them once all three are in. Again, these are 12 millimeter. Curious to hear about if you guys have one of these cars and what do you have? Done any modifications to it? I honestly have never worked on one before today. So kind of curious to see what people are doing with them. I mean, they are pretty close in design to the the Super, right? I mean, the, the motor's the 2JZ GE, the Super is the 2JZ GTE, which, uh, from what I understand, is basically a super engine minus the twin turbos, different intake manifold, different heads, and I think piston cooling jets, right? So, in theory, I guess you could use this, this car as the basis for a Super, right? If you wanted to pull the motor out, stick it in a super, you probably could. Need an extension for that one. Tighten down that middle bolt. A little tough to get to without an extension. A little tough to get to, period. All right, so our seats are good to go. This screw here was the one that was holding the, uh, the fuel pump controller on. So don't need that screw anymore. Let's get the bottom seat in. We should be good to go. All right, everybody. So we got the back seats back together and uh, now we have a running car. So ran it for half an hour, um, did not stall again. So this car is certainly in runnable, sellable condition. It's not ideal. It does need a lot more work. You know, probably needs a tune up, um, has some oil leaks, but the owners don't want to put that money into it. They just wanted to get it running and get it sold. So that's what I did. Hopefully you found this video helpful. If you did, please subscribe, stay safe. Thanks for watching everybody. Take care.